Hello and welcome to our two-part tutorial video on early medieval brooches. In these two videos we'll tell you how to recognise early medieval brooches and how to record them onto the PAS database. We'll start by looking at a general background before moving on to terminology and finally a look at the brooches themselves, starting just after the Roman conquest and ending with the Norman conquest. In this video, part one, we will look at the earliest brooches from around AD 410 to 700. In the second video, part two, we'll cover the middle and late periods from AD 700 to 1066. Brooches are the most common early medieval find on the PAS database, with about 20% of all early medieval objects being brooches. There are more brooches than there are coins for this period. This chart shows how they break down by sub-period. This is pretty extraordinary, even when you allow for the early part of the period being a bit longer than the others. The overwhelming majority of brooches are from the early part of the period. The main reason for this is that the early Anglo-Saxon period is the age of furnished graves, with people being buried fully dressed. So we'll start off with a little bit on dating and who's wearing the brooches. Brooches were one of the commonest objects to be put in early Anglo-Saxon furnished graves, and we know from the skeletons that they are always in the graves of women, as here. This is because they were worn on the clothes of women, and because the early Anglo-Saxons were normally buried in their clothes. Therefore, the graves are the way in which we date the early Anglo-Saxon brooches. Essentially, we can assume that all the objects found in a single grave were in use at a single moment. So over the life of an object type, it will occur in graves with earlier types at the start and later types towards the end. With enough object types, a relative sequence can be worked out. This dating technique is known as seriation. It's harder to add absolute calendar dates to the sequence because these usually come from coins, but there are no coins in regular use in the early Anglo-Saxon world. Although attempts have been made for a very long time to fit the English sequences to continental evidence where there are better coin dates. More recently, seriation has been perked up with statistical techniques such as correspondence analysis here on the top right, which can order objects with various characteristics or variables into a curve, and this may correspond to differences in date. There's also been a recent attempt to combine carbon dating with statistical analysis, and this has pushed the dates of early Anglo-Saxon brooches slightly earlier in general. The major change in artefact types during the early Anglo-Saxon period comes at the end of a sequence known as the Migration Period, when various peoples like Angles, Saxons and Jutes are migrating around Europe, and again at the start of another period of time, known as the Conversion Period, when people aren't moving around so much but are settling down and establishing kings and Christianity. Most brooch types suddenly go out of use at the end of the Migration Period, which is broadly the 5th and 6th centuries. The conversion period is broadly 7th century, but starting at around 570 AD, although this date may change in the future. At the end of the 7th century, grave goods stop being found in burials, and this is a pretty sudden end, so we can safely say that Anglo-Saxon brooch types that haven't been found in graves are unlikely to have been used on costume before around 700 AD. Dating middle and later Anglo-Saxon brooches is much harder. We can't use grave goods for working this out because people are no longer buried in their clothes and jewellery. We have to use pictures instead. Here are two examples, William the Conqueror wearing a brooch at the shoulder and King Harold wearing a brooch at the neck. Incidentally, men don't wear brooches until the late Anglo-Saxon period. Now, let's look in detail at the early Anglo-Saxon brooches. We've used the term early Anglo-Saxon here, rather than early, early medieval, because nearly all of the early medieval brooches from the earlier part of the period recorded on the database are in fact Anglo-Saxon. There are very few Irish brooches, 
or French, Cornish, Scottish or Welsh, less than 20 in fact, and so we'll not cover them here. So we are using the cultural label Anglo-Saxon and the period early medieval. Most of the time in practice they mean the same thing, but it's good to remember what the difference really is underneath. Here are some good general reference books for early Anglo-Saxon brooches. MacGregor and Bolick, shown here on the left, is still perhaps the best general book. It's got references to all the research up to 1993, with summaries and lots of pictures. The volume in the middle by Samantha Lucy is fairly expensive, but it is a good, really reliable volume with lots of scholarly background. Then the volume on the right is free to download and again has lots of very good images for reference. There are lots of other books, so do ask your Finds Liaison Officer and also see our online guide for more recommendations. We're now going to look at the commonest types of early Anglo-Saxon brooches. We'll divide them into two major groups, the long brooches, also known as bow brooches, and the circular brooches, with a brief look at other shapes at the end. The vast majority of all early Anglo-Saxon brooches can be divided into these two groups. The other brooch shapes are quite rare. This image shows you which are the most popular types, with the numbers in brackets. These are the nationwide figures, but because early Anglo-Saxon brooches are very regionalised, what you see most of will depend where you are in the country. We'll start off with the long brooches. There are two major types, the cruciform and the small long. We'll go on to look at these in detail in a moment, but for now, have a look at this image, which shows one cruciform and one small long, to show you the broad outlines. All long brooches have three parts, the bow in the centre, the head at one end and the foot at the other. You may think that these brooches look extremely hard to describe, but the trick is to divide up a brooch into its three parts and only look at one part at a time. Let's start with the cruciform brooch, which is extremely standardised and therefore the easiest to get your head around. The cruciform brooch is defined as being a bow brooch with a horse head terminal. You can see the horse's head here at the bottom with its eyes and nostrils. This image shows the names for all of the pieces and has been adapted from Toby Martin's PhD and book on cruciform brooches, which is a fantastic piece of work and well worth reading if you have a particular interest in early Anglo-Saxon artefacts. These diagrams have literally every bit of terminology you would ever need but there are some variations from Toby's terms, so we will go through each part in turn. The basic division for the head is the head plate, that's the bit in the centre, and the knobs. The knobs can be made separately or cast in one with the head plate, as shown here. Whichever, they do tend to break off, particularly the knobs on the side. The earliest of the cruciforms tend to have separately made knobs, and these are very common finds in their own right. The two side knobs were originally actually functional. They had drilled holes through which the iron pin bar was threaded, so the pin bar ran through the side knobs and the central pin bar lug, and the side knobs were then fixed onto the edges of the head plate. You can see the hole on these three on the right. The fixing was done either simply with a groove or slot on the base of the knob, or a projecting tab. A slot is the most common, and you can see them here in the two right-hand examples. It seems amazing that this would be strong enough to keep the knobs on, but the pin bar would have helped too. Alternatively, occasionally, you get a tab which is normally soldered on. You can see that the knobs came in two basic shapes. These three, on the top left and bottom right, are what's known as full round, so circular or oval in cross-section. The other two are what's known as half round, so semicircular or semi-oval in cross-section. This one top right is hollow on the reverse, presumably to save metal and make the brooch slightly lighter in weight. 
In general, we tend to think that full round knobs are the earlier form, as they are ultimately developed from the full round knobs of Roman crossbow brooches. We also think that the separately made knobs are generally earlier than those that are made in one piece with the head plate. Here are some examples of knobs cast in one with the head plate. We call the rounded part the dome, the broad groove below that is the waist, and below that is the base, as shown here. The rest of the head, apart from the knobs, is known as the head plate. This is usually divided into a thicker raised central panel and flatter wings, as you can just about see here. But sometimes the head plate is just a simple rectangle. There are often vertical lines of small stamps or punch marks down the edges, either of the wings or of the central panel. Look hard for these as they can get worn off. On the reverse, there is usually a single pin bar lug, occasionally a double lug, and this is always set longitudinally in line with the pin. Moving on to the bow, this is often hardly described at all and the vocabulary available isn't great. The problem is how to describe the shape. Decoration is easier. Before the PAS, people used to call this a faceted bow, but this is a bit vague. It's best to say that there is a short area with re rectangular cross section at the top and bottom and in between the bow is curved in cross section, both in side view, along the long axis, and in transverse cross section. You can push this point home by saying that it's hollow on the reverse or C-shaped or V-shaped in cross section. Or if it's flat on the reverse, it's probably triangular or semicircle in cross section. There are a lot of ways of describing it, so just have a go. Lastly, we have the foot. The foot naturally falls into two parts. The rather flatter bit, which always has the catch plate on the reverse, and the bit below. We use the word foot for the whole of the area below the bow, and we do this for every early Anglo-Saxon bow brooch. For this area at the top, generally we just describe it. And if we have to call it anything, we call it the flat panel. It's often divided up into some areas with bevelled edges, and other areas having transverse decoration, sometimes grooves, sometimes ridges. It can also have these little projections called lappets. Lappet means a small flap. It's a tricky word because it's also used for something in the Viking world, which we'll come on to in our second video. But in the early Anglo-Saxon world, lappets are sideways projections on a brooch just below the bow. They can be simple flat rectangular or semicircle shapes, but the nicest ones are like these in the shape of little predatory bird heads with curving beaks and relief decoration in what's known as style one. Everything below, so that's below the flat panel on the front and the catch plate on the reverse, is called the terminal. And for the area below the nostrils, we tend to use the word extension. Cruciform brooches can vary a great deal in size. The two shown here are at the same scale. The smaller ones tend to be earlier and they tend to be narrower with more rounded knobs and have a deeper catch plate on the reverse of the foot. You can see in the example on the left how the catch plate extends down onto the reverse of the terminal. Later brooches tend to be larger overall and wider and flatter with shorter catch plates. It can be difficult to describe the shapes of the catch plates so make sure you orient your viewer. If you have a complete or near complete catch plate, it's important to explain which way it's curved to hold the end of a pin. So we might say something like, when looking at the reverse of the brooch with head plate uppermost, the catch plate is curled over to the observer's left. It seems that the vast majority of catch plates on any brooch go to the left when looking at the reverse, so it's worth flagging up any that you find which go to the right. There have been several studies of cruciform brooches over the years. The first published typology was Arberg in 1926, who settled on five groups, and these have proved amazingly resilient, 
all subsequent studies have used the Arberg groups as a basis, and you will quite often still see an Arberg type quoted. Their main use is that they are a very convenient shorthand, but you do have to have the relevant bit of the brooch. So obviously if you only have the foot, you can't really tell what's happening on the head plate. This is also an issue with Catherine Mortimer's typology. These are both designed for complete brooches found in graves. On the other hand, Toby Martin's thesis uses PAS material, so understands that we'll often be dealing with fragments. It's also nice and up-to-date and very statistically solid. Toby's PhD is available on the British Library's Ethos website. But to get all of the illustrations, you will need the book, which was published in 2015. Toby divides cruciform brooches up into four groups, one to four, mainly based on Arburg, but with groups three and four taken together. And we'll look at these in more detail now. Let's start with group one. These are small, simple and narrow brooches, mostly with full round knobs. The head plates are small and narrow, no wider than the bow, and have tiny little wings. They have full round knobs, usually made separately, and so they're generally missing from the finds that we see. The one pictured here has been corroded on by the remains of the iron pin gear. The bows are highly arched and the catch plates are deep. They can be dated to the first half of the 5th century, so from around 420 to 475 AD. Group 2 are clearly a development from the group 1s, and at the other end shade into group 3s. They are broader, generally larger, but still simple brooches without lappets. When there are wings, they tend to be wider. The one on the right has no wings, but it's wider anyway than a group 1. The knobs are usually half round, but can either be separately made or cast in one with the head plate, or both of course. It's quite possible for the top knob to be cast in one with the head plate and for the side knobs to be made separately and fixed on with the pin bar. That's almost certainly the case with the examples on the left, where we have no side knobs surviving. These are from about 475 to 550 AD. Group 3 are maybe a bit wider and flatter again, but it's often very difficult to tell the difference between head plates of group 2 and group 3. Both have half round knobs, but the group 3s generally have them made in one piece with the head plate. The difference is clear if you have either lappets or the extensions below the nostrils, or both. The lappets can have style 1 relief ornament on them. Group 3 date from around 500 to 550 AD, starting a little bit later than the group 2s. Group 4 are wider, flatter and longer. The ones pictured here are 6 inches long, so around 150 millimetres. The knobs are completely flat and have style 1 art on them. There is often also style 1 on the head plate and on the flat panel of the foot and on the terminal. They are generally known as florid because of this. They date to about 500 to 570 AD. Here the horse head is just a couple of eyes and they can develop into a human head instead of a horse, as shown in the centre here. A quick word on fragments. Florid cruciforms tend to break up into lots of small bits which aren't very easy to recognise. There are many other similarly decorated objects, both dress accessories and horse harness accessories, so it's not easy to recognise if it's from a brooch. Sometimes you do have clues, such as the example on the top left, which has the pair of lugs on the reverse to hold the pin bar, but other times it's not so obvious. And remember, if you do get stuck, you can always check with your finds liaison officer or one of our finds advisors. The Martin groups are a pretty robust set of groups, and so we can safely use them as shorthand when recording early Anglo-Saxon brooches. You can put the Martin group in the subclassification field. If you can get down to Martin's subgroups or sub-subgroups, then of course do this as well. The last thing to say about cruciform brooches is that they were often decorated with stamps or punch marks. 
Toby Martin has produced some schematic illustrations for these in his book. Do use his numbers and describe them in words as backup, and eventually we may be able to do some die linking studies. Now we'll move on to the great square headed brooch. This is also a very standardised and easily recognisable brooch type. John Hines's book is the best source for these, but it can be expensive. Alternatively, you could look at records of similar brooches on the PAS database. We've recorded nearly 300 of the great square headed brooches onto the PAS database and you'll see that they occur in the same parts of the country, roughly, as the cruciform brooches, with a concentration in the Anglian area. One of the reasons that we have so many on the database is that they, like the cruciform brooches, tend to break up very easily into lots of fairly recognisable fragments. We won't go through all the various types as we did with the cruciforms because there are 25 of them and they are not all easy to recognise. So instead we're going to point out a few things that will help you recognise a great square headed brooch. Firstly of course, great square headed brooches, as you can see, don't have square heads. They have rectangular heads and lots of relief decoration with panels of style one or geometric decoration in this high relief chip carved style, divided by undecorated or less decorated borders. Chip carving is a term borrowed from wood carving, but when it's used on metalwork it doesn't really mean that the metal was actually carved, it just looks a bit like it. The essential thing about chip carving is that the ups and downs are V-shaped, so it looks like it's been done with a chisel. It's possible that the work on a wax or wooden model was done with a chisel though. Fragments of great square headed brooches can be recognised by this relief decoration, which is generally arranged in a pretty standard scheme, which has been summarised by John Hines. A simplified version is shown here on the right. Great square headed brooches were dated by John Hines to around 500 to 570 AD. In common with most 6th century brooches, they are quite large and heavy, generally about 10 to 15 centimetres long. They are mostly made from copper alloy, but can occasionally be made from silver. The most common surface treatment is gilding, about half seem to be gilded, but quite a lot also have some sort of silvering or tinning. A thin wash is usually tinning, but sometimes there are soldered on silver plates. These don't often survive in the plough soil, but you can sometimes see the patches of solder, as shown here on the left. Here are a couple of unusual features to watch out for. Firstly, there's the disc on this one's bow. These are rare, but can get quite big. As they're made separately and fixed on with a rivet, they can be found on their own, but they aren't always easy to recognise. Another thing to see on this brooch is the patch of textile on the front. It's been preserved by the copper corrosion that makes a toxic environment and kills bacteria, so it doesn't decay. Again, it's not common to find surviving preserved textile, but it is something to look out for. This shows that there was clothing over the brooch as well as being fastened by it. Now, as well as great square-headed brooches, we also have small square-headed brooches. There are some examples pictured here. At one time, it was thought that they were concentrated in Kent and the Isle of Wight. You can see from this distribution map that this is no longer the case, although they do seem to be more common in the southeastern part of England. So although you'll find this type of brooch also called a Kentish square-headed brooch, don't use this term. Like the great square-headed brooches, small square-headed brooches are usually made from copper alloy, but there are also quite a lot of silver ones. Again, they are usually gilded, 
and the decoration is relief decoration. The commonest size is perhaps four centimetres long. Again, these head plates aren't usually square, they're rectangular. The one picture top left is silver and the others are copper alloy. Look at the relief decoration. The head plates generally have this concentric geometric decoration, a little bit like that on the great square heads. There's also some yellow in the silver one. The best source for these brooches is David Lee's PhD thesis, available from Ethos. There are two other sources which are useful for Kent. These are the Mill Hill Report by Parfit and Brugman and the most recent Buckland Dover Report by Parfit and Anderson. Moving on to another small brooch, the small long brooch. This is, at heart, a kind of small imitation of both the cruciform and the square-headed brooches. The type is elastic enough to encompass most small bow brooches, which may explain the name. If cruciform and square heads are long brooches, then these are the small variants of the long brooch, so small long. On the whole, the small long brooch is difficult to define. In some ways, the group feels a bit like a catch-all, including all the bow brooches left after the other more distinctive types have been removed. The first thing you might notice is how similar this one is to the small square-headed brooch, and it's really distinguished because it doesn't have the relief decoration. But really, to define them properly, we need to divide them into head, bow and foot, and not only do small longs have quite a variety of heads and feet, but these can be combined in a huge variety of ways. Here are some examples of heads. You'll immediately see that the basic shape is square or rectangular, with these notches or cutouts, which are normally U-shaped or sometimes circular perforations. Decoration consists of engraved lines and stamps, or punch marks, or stamped punch marks. There's no relief decoration, no chip carving, and no style one art. And the central panel here is quite different to what's on the cruciform brooches. These decorative extensions on the bottom three examples have led some people to call the shape of this head plate trefoil. We tend to describe them as flat knobs, as they are clearly derived from the knobs on the cruciform brooches. Here are some more unusual head plates, which can be a challenge to describe. You can see that these more Baroque examples can sometimes have simple lappets. And here are some feet. The most common foot is flared, either with a straight edge at the bottom or a curved edge. The catch plate, as you can see, is at the top of the foot. And when a break occurs below the catch plate, so you only have the terminal, it can be difficult to identify. In the middle of these brooches is the bow. There are several types, but these three shown here are by far the most common. Again, they're all rather difficult to describe. The first type is found on a lot of long brooches, and you'll see it over and over again. It has a rectangular section flat panel at the top and bottom, and a beveled or C-section area in between, leading to the little triangular facets. The second type has a single triangular facet at top and bottom, and is V-shaped in cross-section. The third type is simply V-shaped in cross-section, or possibly triangular if it has a flat reverse. Here are some complete ones. Usually you get the flared foot with the trefoil heads and the lozenge form feet with the rectangular heads, but there are no hard and fast rules. Now we've seen it's pretty simple to tell these apart from the square heads, both great and small, because small longs never have any relief decoration. It's always simply incised and stamped. But you may wonder how you tell them apart from the smaller cruciform brooches. Well, 
Generally, cruciforms are larger and better made, and their head plates usually have central panels and wings, rather than being in one piece. There will always be difficult cases, though, in which case add both possibilities to the classification field, small long or cruciform. Here is a distribution map of the small long brooches. Again, it's not very different from the cruciform brooches, mainly in the Anglian area of England, but with other hotspots too. So those are the main varieties of bow brooch, and they cover over 95% of the long brooches. But there are also a surprising number of radiate headed and miniature bow brooches, and they are poorly understood, largely because there aren't that many found in graves, so they lack those good contexts that help us understand what's going on. The ones that are found in graves are mainly from Kent and tend to have five knobs that radiate out from the head. Complete radiate headed brooches of this type are rather hard to find on the PAS database. The one on the left here, interestingly analysed at 47% silver, has lost nearly all of its radiating knobs so as to be almost unrecognisable. The other two on the slide are from the Ashmolean Museum, found in Kent. The radiate head is a very classic continental type, mainly Frankish, but with variants all across Europe. This one from Lincolnshire is the commonest French type, with the five knobs cast in one around the head, and a bow and foot decorated together with hardly any break between the two. They can alternatively have lozenge form feet, so in that way they resemble small longs a little, although as you can see, they can have relief decoration. They are about the same size as small longs, so quite small, and they are quite often made from silver. This slide shows fragments. The two at the top are just the heads, with knobs cast in one with the head plate. The two at the bottom are fragments of feet with distinctive decoration. Very few of the lozenge form feet are recognised as being from radiate heads and they may be being mixed up with small longs or small square heads. Then we have other brooches without quite so many radiating knobs, which are sometimes called radiate headed and sometimes called miniature bow brooches. They are very rarely found in graves, either in England or on the continent. We now have so many on the PAS database that it seems likely that they were actually made here. This has already been suggested by Berta Brugman, who wrote up two found in graves in Kent, one from Mill Hill and one from Buckland Dover, but these still need a lot more research. At present, it seems that the term miniature bow brooch is not helpful and we should put radiate head in the classification field for all of them that have these semicircular head plates whether they have five knobs or three or none at all. They definitely make a good research project for someone. If we do this, it bumps the numbers up considerably. And here's the distribution map of radiate headed brooches using this definition. There is a concentration in Kent, but you can get them all over the place. We also need more research on the next group, the equal arm brooches. There's a wide range of these, and as you'd expect from the name, both the head and foot are identical. The earliest type, the one shown here, are also the best studied, having been looked at by Dot Bruns and Vera Edverson. This type is also found on the continent, Dot calls them Germanic, and the art on them is also sometimes called the Saxon relief style. The pin bar lugs tend to be double and widely spaced to reinforce the fixings of a large and heavy brooch. There is also a version which doesn't have relief ornament. The surfaces are flat instead with ring and dot or stamped designs. It's very hard to know what to call them to distinguish them from the other types of equal arm brooch. 
They are divided up into 10 or 11 types by dot, and it's arguable that we should leave the subclassification field for dots types. So at present, we're adding wide equal arm to the classification field. These ones are hardly long brooches because they are actually quite short and wide, but the other equal arm types are longer and narrower. This is also an equal arm brooch, although we don't have any complete examples on the PAS database yet. It's very plain and severe and generally found in Anglian areas, not Saxon areas, so it tends to be known as the Anglian equal arm brooch. It's not common, but it does turn up in graves, and so it has attracted attention for a while. If you record one, use Anglian equal arm in the classification field. These ones are completely the reverse. They are hardly ever found in graves, and so before the PAS began, they were almost completely unknown. They are now much more common than any other sort of equal arm brooch, but until now they've not had a precise name. For now, we've decided to use the pretty simple term long in contrast to wide, so put long equal arm in the classification field. We have so many of them now, we're beginning to think that they must be of English design and manufacture, not continental imports. Recently, this unfinished one shown top right was found on the Isle of Wight, which pretty much confirms that they were made there at least. This slide shows the most common type of long equal arm brooch with roughly triangular plates and often rounded terminals set the other way up to the wide and the Anglian equal arms so that the head and foot taper away from the bow rather than towards the bow. They are very definitely early in the early medieval period. Some people have confused them with later ansate brooches, but this is really not right for lots of reasons, including their punched ornament and relief decoration, and their pin fixings, which are always longitudinal. If you only have the head end of this brooch with a pin bar lug on the reverse, you'll be able to identify it as an equal arm. But if you only have a foot, you could be dealing with a small long instead. And in fact, Barry Ager has suggested that the brooch was invented by putting two small long foot plates together. If you do have just a foot plate, because small longs are so much more common, it's more likely to be from a small long brooch. But do mention the possibility of it being a long equal arm in the description. The two pictured here are rather more unusual, but still on the same basic theme. The one on the right has these interesting knobs from cruciform brooches, so it isn't just small longs that they are drawing inspiration from. This is the distribution map for long equal arm brooches so far. It's interesting that there are none yet found in Norfolk. In fact, it's what's thought of as quite a Kentish type distribution with concentrations in Kent and in Hampshire and on the Isle of Wight. These brooches would also make an interesting research project, looking at what they are, where they draw their inspiration from and why they are so rarely found in graves. Here's another unusual pair of odd equal arm brooches, which appear to be made from two head plates. The one on the right seems to be made from two small long head plates and the one on the left from two radiate head head plates. So if you only had the heads of these brooches, you wouldn't know there was anything odd about them. But they are very strange and unusual. There's little that we can put in the classification field, but do tick find of note if you have one of these brooches. Grave finds of long equal arm brooches include Blacknell Field 26, Alfriston 29, Liminge 24, East Shefford Grave 18 and Frilford 1867-0204.8. The last bow brooch we're going to look at is the slightly oddly named supporting arm brooch. Again, they're not found north of Lincolnshire and are most common in East Anglia, but with another little cluster around Winchester. These are very clearly a development from Roman brooches. 
The term supporting arm is a direct translation from the German, as these brooches were first defined in Germany, so that's why it's such a strange term. The arm is in fact wings, each with a perforated lug on the reverse to hold the pin bar, around which the spring is wrapped. There can be a third or even fourth perforated lug in the centre. You'll immediately notice that this brooch type has several affinities with Roman brooches, and really it's a very transitional type between Roman and Anglo-Saxon. The catch plate is right at the bottom of the brooch, or only minimally above it. And actually this is one of the best ways of telling Anglo-Saxon from Roman brooches, as all early Anglo-Saxon long brooches have the catch plate well above the end of the foot, but almost every Roman brooch has the catch plate right at the bottom. But there are a lot of Germanic features here too. The foot is very reminiscent of the flat panel at the top of the foot of cruciform brooches, many small longs and some equal arms with the beveled edges, transverse grooves and scoops like very short bevels, which tend to be known as notches. This brooch pictured bottom right shows even if you're missing the foot, the head is quite distinctive, so easily recognisable. We'll now go on to look at brooches that are all basically circular. We'll start off with the annular and penannular brooches. On the left is an annular brooch, essentially a circular brooch with a large hole in the centre. They're also called ring or frame brooches. In the centre is a penannular brooch. This has an open or discontinuous frame. Penannular means almost annular. There is a tendency on penannular brooches for the pin to slip round the ends of the frame and fall through the gap, so the penannular brooch usually has stops at either end to stop this happening. On the example here, the stops are large terminals. The third brooch on this slide is kind of a hybrid between the annular and penannular, which is called a coit brooch. This has a complete ring, but also has the notch for the pin to pass through and stops to prevent it going back through the notch. These are rare, there are only a few on the PAS database, and many people don't bother to distinguish between annular and coit brooches. So put all complete ring brooches down as annular in the classification field, but do add the word coit somewhere in the description field or perhaps in the subclassification field. The brooch shown here on the left has an interesting construction. The ring or the frame has overlapping ends which each have a hole and the pin passes through both holes. Occasionally instead you can find a rivet closing the ring and a separate pin hole or constriction. You can see copper alloy pins shown here, perhaps used because the pin is more visible on this brooch type than on the ones where it's just concealed on the reverse. There is some development through time. This wide flat type on the left, often with stamps, is essentially late 5th to late 6th century and there is some evidence from correspondence analysis that those with long pin slots are on average a little earlier than those with holes. In the late 6th and 7th centuries, annular brooches become much smaller, as shown by the example on the right. The cross section becomes thicker and narrower, sometimes rectangular, sometimes D-shaped, and sometimes circular in cross section. Occasionally, as here on the bottom right, they come with characteristic 7th century decoration, such as style 2 animal heads and groups of transverse lines. Here is a distribution map of annular brooches. As you can see, it's got really quite a solid distribution down the eastern side of the country, which is usually thought of as the Anglian culture province, covering what becomes East Anglia, the eastern half of Mercia and Northumbria. Moving on now to penannular brooches, or those with an incomplete ring. These are also found in the Iron Age and Roman periods, which is extremely unusual for an early medieval brooch type. We've got about 100 on the database which have been dated to the early medieval period. Two are shown here, along with the distribution map, which as you can see looks very different to any other brooch type we've looked at so far. It's much more evenly scattered around the whole country, but none in the far southeast as yet. The best source for all of them from any period is Anna Booth's PhD.
We'll now move on to the other types of circular brooches, disc, saucer and button. We have a problem disentangling these on the database because they're easy to define as brooches but the records are hard to count. This is because one of the very earliest records, Kent 53, which is a button brooch, contains some discussion about how similar these are to saucer brooches and so the record contains both terms. This record has then been referenced many times and so if we do a simple search for saucer we also get a lot of button brooches and vice versa. So you'll need to use the correct syntax to search the classification field. This is shown in the box in the top right. Simply type the text shown for each brooch type into the search box. We'll start with the disc brooches as they are the simplest of the solid circular brooches. A disc brooch in the early Anglo-Saxon period isn't any old flat circular brooch but is a specific form. We've got around 200 on the database. There's a concentration in the Hampshire, Sussex, Isle of Wight area, some with particularly nice decoration, but otherwise they're spread pretty evenly over the southern half of the country, south of the Seven Wash line. Early Anglo-Saxon disc brooches are characteristically flat with a limited range of decorative motifs. The makers apparently chose from concentric circles, central dots, ring and dot motifs and indentations around the edge. They often have a white metal coating on the front. When this has been analysed it pretty much always turns out to be tin. Generally these are thought to be pretty large, around 35 to 40 millimetres in diameter, but there are some smaller examples like the two shown on the right. We can plot out the diameters of these brooches, which gives the graph shown here to the nearest millimetre. We've compared it with a group of brooches from graves in the Oxfordshire area, the bottom chart, and as you can see ours are generally a bit smaller and there are two peaks, one around 26mm and one around 36mm in diameter. We still need to do some research to work out whether the larger or smaller sizes or the variation in decoration means something interesting. The smaller ones might well be from somewhere specific, like the Isle of Wight, for example. There's a less common variant of the disc brooch, which is openwork. It still has the same large size and flat shape and can have ring and dot decoration or stamps, but it also has cutouts, often of T, L or V shape, making generally either a cross or swash sticker shape. There's less than a dozen of these on the database so far, and it's worth distinguishing them in the classification field, so put open work disc in the classification field to group them all together. You can then use the words cross or swash sticker or whatever when you describe them in the description field. Also, do check your spelling. Don't use disc with a K, as that is the American spelling. Now we'll move on to button brooches. These are small cast brooches, generally about 20 millimetres in diameter, which nearly always have the same decoration of a rather angry looking human face looking out at the observer. This is normally set within an upturned rim, although of course this often erodes away in the plough soil. They are always made from copper alloy. Two lead versions are known, but these are thought to be models used in the casting process. Button brooches are normally gilded. Because they are small and chunky, they are tough and tend to survive in reasonably good condition. Here is a distribution map from Suzuki, published in 2008, and next to it is the current distribution from the PAS database. There are also 11 known from northern France, which is unusual and interesting. You can see how geographically restricted they tend to be, mostly in this southeastern quarter of the country, southeast of Oxford. It's very similar to the map for the small square heads and the long equal arms, as shown here. Back to the buttons themselves. Who is the person depicted? It's been suggested as Woden, and Kevin Leahy has pointed out that one way of recognising Woden is to look for an absent, damaged or odd-looking eye. Woden famously swapped one of his eyes for extra wisdom. 
It's always a good idea if you are looking at an early, early medieval depiction of a human face to have a particularly good look at the eyes. Button brooches were originally studied by Avant and Everson in 1982, and more recently this typology has been slightly revised by Suzuki. Suzuki's book, though relatively expensive, is excellent and has lots of very clear photos. For dating, Suzuki gives a date of around 480 to 550 AD. Moving on to saucer brooches, and the main source for these is the work of Tanya Dickinson. Saucer brooches are similar to button brooches but larger. They were worn in pairs, so in graves it's normal to find two very similar but not mould identical brooches together. They come in two forms, the applied and the cast. We'll start off with the cast saucer brooches. They have the upturned rim, familiar from the button brooches, which gives them their name, but their decoration is much more varied. They are generally bigger than button brooches, from around 25mm in diameter for the teeny ones, up to about 80mm in diameter for the very large. It seems that the ones that look later are often larger, although this hasn't been properly established by detailed analysis. They have a restricted set of chip carved designs. Top right especially you can see the V-shaped grooves and ridges. There is as yet no convenient typology, so nothing precise to put in the subclassification field. Instead, it's probably worth simply using some keywords based on what Dickinson calls them in her 1993 article. The most common design is the running spiral, so called because each of the spirals is linked to the next. There can be five or more running spirals. Here we can see five, seven and six. Other designs include the star, mainly five point, sometimes six point. We also have plenty of designs based on crosses. The Floriot cross, top right, which is very standardised, and these two, bottom right and top left, with style one faces as well as crosses and the other one here, which is quite hard to interpret. Incidentally, look how small this one is, just 21 millimetres across. The most complex motifs are the style one designs, and Tanya Dickinson has written an entire article on these, which is incredibly useful for understanding style one in general. Notice the hole in the brooch at the bottom right, a repair, which is quite common. The so-called applied saucer brooches would have looked very similar to the cast ones, but they were made at least in part from sheet metal. Because of this, they don't survive at all well in the plough soil, and fragments are also hard to recognise. This drawing represents the basic form, with a strip forming the rim, which is bent round and overlapped. Then it's attached somehow, probably with a lot of solder, to a backplate. Here, the backplate has slots cut into it for the pin, lug and catch plate. These are made like paper fasteners, with bits of strip folded in half, the ends pass through the slot and bent out to hold them in place. Then more solder is put on the back plate to hold an impressed foil in place. The foils can have any of the designs of the cast saucers. These slotted back plates very rarely survive or are very rarely recognised, and we only have a few of them on the PAS database. What we do have is an odd little group of what appear to be cast back plates from applied saucer brooches with integral lugs and catch plates. They do have the applied elements too, so there's decayed solder and missing foils. So that's an odd sort of hybrid saucer brooch which is, as far as we're aware, otherwise unknown. We've also recorded this foil in the top right, which is an extraordinary survival and also a die for producing a very similar foil, though not exactly the same. The last group of circular brooches that we're going to look at are the jewelled disc brooches. These include some of the most beautiful works of art ever created, and therefore absolutely must not be confused with normal disc brooches. So that's another reason why the classification field absolutely must be filled in correctly. It's unlikely that you might record one of these. There are less than 50 on the database currently, so we won't go into them in too much detail here.
There are three types of jewelled disc brooch, known as the keystone, the plated and the composite. It seems sensible to put these specific words in the classification field and only used jewelled disc when you are really not sure. All have been classified by Richard Avent and the subclassification field can be used for the specific type, the Avent class. The earliest keystone disc brooches, classes 1 and 2, date from the mid 6th century, so 525 to 575 AD. The later types, classes 3 to 7, are a bit later, maybe around 550 to 600 AD. The plated disc brooches were made in the late 6th and early 7th centuries and the composite discs the early to the middle 7th century. And that ends the most common circular brooches. Other shapes of brooch are really not at all common and are largely found only in Kent, the Isle of Wight and Hampshire. Here is a bird brooch and two S-shaped brooches with bird heads. Now you may very often only have a fragment of brooch and often this fragment includes a bit of the pin fixings. This is usually the chunkiest part of the brooch and therefore survives best. They can help the fragment to be recognised as a brooch. Early Anglo-Saxon brooches always have their pin bar lug in line with the catch plate. They are on the same axis or parallel. There is usually a single lug, occasionally a double, but they are generally D-shaped or sometimes rectangular with a drilled perforation and always set parallel to the pin. The correct term for this lug is the pin bar lug, but people often shorten this to pin lug. Technically, a pin lug is a lug that has the pin passed through it. The pin bar lug has a bar passing through it. The spring is then coiled around the bar, ending in the pin. You can just about see the spring on this example at the bottom. These, of course, are iron pin bars and iron pins. We don't currently know of any copper alloy springs and pins. For annular brooches, copper alloy pins are much more common, although never as common as iron. This may be because the pin of an annular brooch is much more visible. With the long brooches, or the bow brooches, the catch plate is almost always above the terminal of the foot, as shown here on these small longs. This is a good way of distinguishing fragments of Roman from fragments of early Anglo-Saxon brooches if you need to. Don't forget to note down the direction in which the catch plate curls, if it survives well enough. We've now been through all the migration period brooches, but before we leave the early Anglo-Saxon period behind completely, we need to look at the conversion period, the late 6th and 7th centuries. This is when the number of brooches used begins to decline, and in fact it declines quite sharply. There are a very few large brooches found in the early 7th century, mainly these very rich jewelled composites, and the latest of these, perhaps mid-7th century, have copper alloy cloisons, not gold. In the second half of the century, we have a few small flimsy annulars and penannulars, and one very rare and very fragile type of brooch, which is called the safety pin brooch because it very much resembles the modern wire safety pin. Other than that, there's not really anything. So as we move into the Middle Anglo-Saxon period in the 8th century, most people had already given up using brooches. Lastly, we should have a quick look at early Anglo-Saxon lead brooch fragments. These are normally small due to the softness and fragility of lead. The hypothesis is that they are models used in the process of casting a copper alloy brooch rather than brooches in their own right. This is not by any means certain, so look carefully for evidence when recording one of these. For example, an unpierced pin bar lug or a catch plate which hasn't yet been curled over to hold the end of the pin. This brings us to the end of part one on early Anglo-Saxon brooches. Please join us in part two for middle to late Anglo-Saxon, Scandinavian and Anglo-Scandinavian brooches.